Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is August. Yes, I was born in the month of August, the 17th. Uh, Leo Power, and as uh, I mentioned, um, I worked in design, and uh, I currently work for a company called uh, Vara, which pr promotes uh, financial inclusion for the majority of Americans that are overcharged and underserved or just outright excluded uh, from everyday financial services. But I have worked for uh, um, companies and products uh, that you might have heard of. I spent 14 years at Microsoft, where my last role was head of design for Xbox. And then um, I moved to the Bay Area a few years ago, uh, where I worked for Pinterest. Um, and then right before Varo, I spent some time at Google. And what's interesting about uh, this sequence of jobs is uh, when I used to tell people I uh, worked at Xbox, uh, I'd often hear, oh, my son or husband or boyfriend would want to meet you. And then when I worked at Pinterest, I'd hear, oh, my daughter, my wife, my girlfriend would want to meet you. Then when I worked at Google, no one wanted to meet me. <laughs> so I want to um, start my story uh, with a little bit of a provocation, which is this. Whenever I see a bendable straw, I see a love story. So let me explain. Uh, back in 2013, um, I was working for Xbox, uh, and at that time, I would have characterized it as my dream job. And well into that role, um, I'd read an article that suggested a good night's sleep is the new status symbol. And knowing my obsessive personality, I really got into it. I learned about thread count and different strains of cotton <laughs> and how many layers uh, um, are the right number to make your bed just so. And at that time, I'd bought an overstuffed uh, summer weight duvet. Um, and what it did is it kind of changed uh, the visual proportions of my bed. And one night when I thought I was plopping down into my bed, I actually fell on the floor and hit my back against the side rail of the bed. Um, this resulted in a trip to the emergency room. And because of hospital error and misdiagnosis, um, I ended up with a, a spinal cord injury, and I'm now in the chair. And that's a whole other talk. Um, but uh, what I found was, uh, over the next six months, um, I'd spent time in the hospital, going through recovery, um, and learning my new normal. And the one thing that I knew would make me feel like my old self again was getting back to work. So I just rushed and rushed, hoping to get back uh, uh, to my day job. And what I had found in typical corporate American fashion is when I returned to work, the entire company had gone through this massive reorganization. Um, and I returned to work with a new boss uh, and a new charter. And um, what we found was that all the different heads of design for the different products now reported up to the same person. And uh, this head of design tasked each of us with creating a design agenda. Or in other words, what are the themes or qualities or principles that all of the products at Microsoft uh, could share? And um, obviously, what was top of mind for me at the time was the notion of accessibility. Um, I, along with a couple of colleagues, uh, really pushed for accessibility being part of the design agenda. And in doing so, uh, in our exploration of accessibility, we came across uh, things like universal design and inclusive design, uh, which really struck a chord with me. And just for the purposes of this conversation, I often hear accessibility and then universal design and inclusive design used interchangeably. But I just want to clarify this point. The Accessibility is an outcome. And universal design and inclusive design are two out of many approaches to realize this outcome, where on the one hand, uh, universal design uh, emphasizes the end result, creating uh, as accessible as possible uh, a solution to as many people as possible. In other words, it's a kind of one-size-fits-all uh, uh, solution while inclusive design, on the other hand, focuses on the genesis of the problem, uh, typically involving just one person uh, or um, a small group of people. And uh, inclusive design has been around for a while, uh, but it's really taken 
um, a lot of traction lately uh, for two reasons. One, because of the advancement of digital communications technology, and for others, uh, for another point, uh, in 2006, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, uh, in their Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, redefined uh, disability from the so-called medical model to the societal model. In other words, the medical model suggests that disability is really a phenomenon based on some sort of physiological uh, or cognitive impairment or difference, while the societal model suggests that disability is, in fact, a mismatch between any person's uh, given spectrum of abilities and the artifacts and environments with which he or she uh, interacts. So this brings us to the kind of damning conclusion that disability is, in fact, designed. And so, in thinking about this, uh, one might think, well, if we apply inclusive design to these kind of single cases or to small groups of people, um, how does it benefit everyone? And in looking at the history of examples of inventions and innovations, we find that this approach benefits many, many people. It takes a kind of uh, leap of faith to assume that if you solve for one, uh, that it'll benefit many. Uh, for example, let's take the remote control. The original design intent of the remote control was actually to help people with mobility differences who couldn't easily get up across the room to change the channel. <laughs> <laughs> but you jump a few decades ahead, each one of us expects a remote control uh, to come with a television. And the list goes on. Uh, early email protocols were invented by Vince Cerf, who was hard of hearing, so that he could communicate more seamlessly with his wife, who was deaf. Uh, the keyboard was invented by Itali an Italian aristocrat uh, whose lover, a contessa who was blind, um, so that she could write letters without assistance. And I'm really curious what were in those letters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, think about the time, last time you uh, took advantage of closed captioning uh, at the airport or in a noisy bar. Uh, the telephone was originally invented as a device to assist the deaf. Uh, there was the electric toothbrush. The cruise, c cruise control on the car was invented uh, by an engineer with low vision who longed to drive again. And think about the times that uh, you've listened to audiobooks. Uh, which brings us to the bendable straw. <laughs> so the bendable straw was invented in the 1930s by Joseph Friedman right here in San Francisco. So it's kind of ironic that we're one of the first cities to ban these things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what happened is he had taken his uh, young daughter, uh, Judith, um, to the soda fountain. And he noticed that, he was fuss that she was fussing with trying to drink her milkshake uh, because the straw went over the tall glass and she had trouble drinking uh, from it. So when he got home, he took a straw, he put a screw inside the straw and wrapped it with dental floss and invented the bendable straw. And uh, the rest is so-called history. But what's interesting about all these innovations is that they're all love stories, that they're all expressions of love from the inventor to someone uh, for whom that they cared about. And so um, what's interesting about this is if you want to start thinking about inclusive design in your own practices, there are kind of three steps to it. The first is seek out a form of exclusion, whether it is you yourself who has felt excluded or to understand how someone has, ex has been excluded uh, from an everyday experience. And then solve on the personal level, solve for that one person or that uh, small group. And this is where it takes that leap of faith, that that solution could not only benefit the person who's been excluded, uh, but will benefit others as you start to scale it to broader and broader audiences. So um, as Courtney mentioned, uh, inclusive design is a shift from a kind of rational model of design where there are hypotheses uh, to an empirical model where even if one person uh, is the target, we have evidence to show that the solution actually works, which I think is much greater than uh, designing for a so-called uh, average user that doesn't even exist. There's no such thing uh, as average users. And so um, it's my hope uh, that as you 
um, embrace inclusive design, uh, you'd be inspired by the words of Charles Eames, who suggested design for someone you love, that someone might be you. Uh, and in doing so, uh, as you look around uh, in your everyday lives, that you realize that you are surrounded by love stories. Thank you for listening.